Olá, gente. Um, hoje temos a honra e o prazer de ter um, o nosso palestrante dessa semana, é Roy Lacey. Ele vai falar em inglês. Vou, um, vou introduzir. Uh, ele fez. Uh, ele originariamente da Jamaica e estudou o bacalhau na Universidade de West Indies, onde se formou em 1978. Depois ele foi para a Universidade de Nova York em Stony Brook um, e fez, e, e fez doutorado em física nuclear. O orientador dele é John Alexander. Depois fiz toda uma série de postdocs um, na França e também nos Estados Unidos, o National Superconducting Cyclotron, um, no, é, no, em, não sei, em Saclay, etc. E depois ele voltou para Stony Brook, onde agora é professor de química. Mas nós vamos perdoar isso. Ele é um chemist, mas nós vamos perdoar e ainda acreditamos. Como sempre, por favor, a gente que tem que assinar a lista de presença, me manda no chat o nome do Array. Um, depois vamos ter, ele vai falar, e depois vamos ter perguntas, onde a gente da Unicamp, uh, there will be a question and answer session, which is open to everyone, although I, I'll give precedence to people from Unicamp, since this is an Unicamp event. Um, and without further ado, Uh, everyone, please mute yourselves. Everyone, please mute yourselves and and uh, turn off your video, except Roy. Um, por favor, por favor, se muda quando ele está falando. De, depois, quando vamos fazer perguntas, eu vou. Você claramente vai poder falar. And without further ado, Roy, please, it's yours. Okay. Well. Um... So I thank you for the invitation. And uh, of course, uh, one of these days I will make uh, a big effort and maybe I can give uh, some fraction of a future presentation in Portuguese and that might make it work even more interestingly. So um, what I want to do is to uh, make an argument uh, that Uh, one currently uh, sees rather strong indications for the chiral magnetic effect uh, in avian collisions at RIC. And uh, the way I'm going to go about this is as follows. I want to introduce the subject a little bit and then speak to uh, anomalous transport, which is really the, the important uh, reason why we want to do this and since this you know is a little bit of a different correlator from most which has been used for these kinds of studies i want to go through uh, some details associated with the intuition as well as the response of the correlator so that hopefully when i start to show you the experimental results you will be reasonably convinced that what we're looking at, we understand and uh, uh, do uh, and can also quantify in some way. And uh, we've, uh, since the development of the correlator, we've extended it to look at other, uh, you know, moments of the signal. I won't touch on that today. But let me just quickly just say that if you're interested, uh, there are a series of publications and preprints uh, that one can go take a look at. Uh, and of course, you can always send me email to uh, uh, discuss further. And obviously, you can see that this name that I'm acknowledging here appears quite a bit. And that's because uh, Magdi, Uh, was a student at Stony Brook. He's now in Chicago as a postdoc, and uh, we still collaborate on the, at least uh, as far as the isobar uh, runs are concerned. The basic takeaway is that we think we have uh, a good correlator that works. 
and it uh, takes account of measuring this signal that we think is CME driven. That's the chiral magnetic effect, of course. And it also mitigates well-known backgrounds, uh, which have uh, been a problem for uh, prior measurements. And the second point, of course, is that we are reasonably convinced that the experimental measurements with the correlator indicates a CME signal. And this is summarized in this particular preprint here. Uh, hopefully, you'll get a chance to take a look at that as well. So let me start uh, in a, with a, a sort of a bigger picture. And just to say that uh, one of the really major uh, focal points of uh, studies which are ongoing at both RIC as well as the Large Hadron Collider is really to chart a phase diagram. And uh, what that really means is that one wants to identify landmarks of the phase diagram. For example, in the crossover region. So here is uh, a rendition of a schematic phase diagram for uh, nuclear matter. And it, this region here we think is a crossover. Then there is the landmark of the critical point. Then there would be the phase coexistent curves uh, as uh, I'm trying to indicate over here. And the whole point then is that one wants to map out this phase diagram. And not only one is interested in the landmarks of the phase diagram, but you'd also like to study the properties of each of these phases. So here, over here would be my quark gluon plasma. And there are many properties, both thermal as well as transport properties, which are of interest. And as I said before, obviously we do that at RIC and as well as the LHC. And one of the advantages of RIC, of course, is that we have very great uh, flexibility in terms of which ions we can collide uh, and over the energy range up to the top energy, which is about 200 jet. And so uh, LHC on the other hand gives us, uh, gives us the opportunity to go towards the energy frontier uh, and therefore one can do uh, nice excitation functions uh, of these various studies. So with that as the backdrop, let me just show you uh, a quick schematic of how we think a collision between two ions would go. So here we're taking symmetric collisions uh, with heavy species and one uh, sees the incoming Lorentz contracted ions. Then this is when they collide. And we think of course that uh, along the way, you form a quark gluon plasma, which then goes through hydrodynamic expansion and ultimately hadronizes, produces particles, which is what we measure. And what we think we can reasonably say we know, for example, is that in terms of properties, that is that you can uh, do analysis, for example, of flow measurements, and you can uh, codify this in terms of so-called anisotropy scaling functions. And from these scaling functions, you can now uh, you know, extract a specific viscosity as a function of root S, which is another way of saying that you can extract this as a function of both temperature and biochemical potential, even uh, strangest potential and isospin, if you prefer. And the essential point is that you see these characteristic patterns. The point here, of course, is to make sure that you understand that there are things that we know about the quark gluon plasma. You can also do uh, a study uh, with the same anisotropous scaling functions and uh, do uh, a, a measure. So this is a figure of merit of the stopping power. And what you can clearly see, of course, is that there is some region where one maximizes the stopping power and you go to higher energies, it seems to go uh, get less uh, at lower energies and correspondingly less at higher energies. And of course, this would be sort of re re reminiscent of uh, critical uh, opalescence if you, know, you believe a Beer's Law type of approach to these kinds of questions. One has also studied 
uh, the uh, net proton fluctuations. And uh, th this is of uh, significant interest because it means that with the moments of these, uh, uh, you know, distribution which reflect the, 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 uh, the, the fluctuations, one can link these to various susceptibility ratios depending on which moments you use. And this is a little quick plot to demonstrate that one sees uh, some uh, non-monotonic pattern in such uh, measures. And uh, there is uh, an ongoing uh, thinking that this could be related to critical fluctuations. And if it is, then of course, one of the things you could quickly try to do is to do uh, say finite size scaling as a figure of merit. And here is a quick little summary that shows that you can take, for example, uh, C2 over C1. These are the cumulants. This ratio is of interest because that would be uh, reminiscent of uh, compressibility. And uh, of course, when you finite size scale, you see that you can collapse all of the data onto one curve. And from that collapse, you can then infer uh, temperature of the critical point, biochemical potential, and of course, the associated critical exponents as reflected in the scaling coefficients that a uh, scaling function that I've shown here. So in a quick little nutshell, what I want to transmit here is that uh, the ongoing studies at RIC, we know a reasonable amount uh, of things. It doesn't mean that everything is crisp. There are debates which are ongoing, but the, the, the pointers are going in a particular direction. Now, if you think about what happens in these same collisions, you come to the conclusion that for at least for off central collisions, you don't just make a plasma, you make a magnetized plasma. And in fact, the magnetization, you know, the magnetic field which is involved in such processes is horrendously large. So, of course, we know that there are large magnetic fields. What is a known unknown is that we don't know very well what the lifetime, in other words, if this thing relaxes quickly to zero as these ions pass each other, then, of course, that there might not be enough time to stay magnetized. Of course, it also it depends on details related to uh, the conductivity of the plasma, and that will have an influence on the lifetime. But the point is that one can now ask, does this magnetization drive anomalous transport? And why would that be important? It would be important, of course, because such anomalous transport can lend some really important insight into the interplay between very, very fundamental issues associated with chiral symmetry restoration and how that interplay goes with, you know, these gluonic fluctuations, et cetera, et cetera. This is not the main subject here, but rather to point out that the whole business of the chiral magnetic effect is Inter intricately linked to these very, very fundamental question, and this is why it's absolutely important, okay? So let me just say then that one of the principal anomalous processes uh, expected in these plasmas, in this quark gluon plasma, is the chiral magnetic effect. And pretty much what the chiral magnetic effect is, is to say that you have a chiral imbalance, uh, you know, and uh, which is related to the, you know, anomalous character of the plasma. And in the presence of these very strong magnetic fields, then what will happen, of course, is that you can then uh, generate a vector current, okay? And of course, the chiral imbalance is reflected in this axial uh, chemical potential. And 
of course, the driver of the current would be the magnetic field. And so obviously uh, that uh, will, uh, from event to event, can uh, uh, point along the magnetic field or against. And of course, that then will have some consequences. In, in other words, this vector current will have some consequences for the distribution of the particles which are emitted. So let me say it in a slightly different way now. So in the reaction, of course, I have uh, a collision. Here is my magnetized quark gluon plasma because here are the spectator nuclei which are going. And that will define a reaction plane. And then, of course, uh, since we know that this is uh, uh, moving charges, then a magnetic field will be perpendicular, as I have indicated here. And since my vector current is along the direction of the magnetic field for this one particular instance, then, of course, I can then induce a charge separation. And it is this charge separation then which will drive e you know, sort of a dipole charge separation. And the essential point then is that <clears throat> that will be reflected in the distribution of particles relative to this reaction plane and can be characterized in terms of this so-called A1 coefficient. Now, obviously, because this guy is flipping back and forth, then it means that one can't really measure the dipole moment, so to speak, but of course you can measure the equivalent of its variance, and that is going to be reflected both in the initial chiral anomaly as well as in the magnitude of the magnetic field. So the essential point then is that detection and characterization of the chiral magnetic effect requires that we try to measure as accurately as we can uh, this uh, so-called dipole charge separation. And the point, of course, is that you want to be able to distinguish this from other potential uh, background effects which would mimic this particular signal. So let me quickly uh, say that uh, one has tried, you know, there's been a long and illustrious uh, effort at RIC designed to try to measure this signal. Here are initial uh, results. Uh, there are even publications earlier than this one. I picked it here uh, just to illustrate that this has happened. And this particular correlate, of course, you can measure same sign charges and opposite sign charges. And then you can take the difference between them. And of course, that is supposed to carry some information about the charge separation. Now, this was known very early in the game that there are background contributions that one has to take account of. And over the years, uh, this has been an ongoing debate as to how best to do that. Here is a quick little measurement to sort of illustrate the complexity here of uh, uh, what happens, of course, if you try to do measurements at the LHC. So one of the ideas that uh, people had was that you say, let's measure, for example, and compare lead lead to P lead. And the essential idea, of course, is that in the P lead collisions, they, you have you don't have a strong correlations between the magnetic field direction and the event plane. So in other words, you don't expect a strong signal, let alone a signal at all in the P lead collisions. And then you'd compare that into lead lead where you the expectation is that you might have a signal. And this scale version here, this is scaled by some V2 to sort of help navigate the uh, background effects. And what one can clearly see here is that the two systems are essentially saying that there is no difference. So the takeaway message is that uh, 
uh, from this particular exercise, you'd conclude that in the small systems, the P led, uh, you don't expect a signal, or if there's one, it would be marginal. But in the bigger system, you would expect a signal. But lo and behold, when you compare the correlator from the two systems, they essentially gave the same, give the same answer. So you're led to the uh, conclusion that at least in these particular measurements, they would be more in, in line with uh, uh, a more background dominated scenario as compared to a signal scenario. So our big question then was, could one make more discerning measurements with a different correlator? And the, the point to make here is that with the new correlator, one can design this from the ground up because after many years of studies, one sort of knows what kinds of backgrounds exist and you can then try to design the correlator in such a way as to navigate or mitigate these kinds of backgrounds. So let me see, show you the rudiments of the correlator. So our correlator, of course, is uh, in, in, in uh, simple uh, thinking, is we try to measure a correlation function along the magnetic field. So that means that this would then quantify the charge separation along the direction of the magnetic field. And then we measure another correlation function, which is perpendicular to the magnetic field. So that means that the correlator, the correlation function, which is perpendicular to the magnetic field cannot have a signal. And therefore, what we're sort of saying is that we're going to take the uh, measure along the magnetic field, which could include a signal and build that ratio. And of course, we use correlation functions simply because we understand correlation functions well and we can control them really nice, okay? And this notation here is simply because we've been able to do this for, you know, the first moment and second moments and so on and so forth. But the essential point is uh, that what I try to take away. All of what I'm going to discuss here is for this dipole-like signal, okay? Now, a second aspect of the correlator is that we can measure, do the same measurement relative to the psi-3 plane. And you will remember that the psi-3 plane is a fluctuations-driven event plane, which means that there is no correlation between it and the direction of the magnetic field. So that means that if we measure that uh, correlate with respect to the psi three, that will be also a reference for background because that correlator is insensitive. And just to complete the list, we can also make measurements for small and large systems, just as I indicated earlier, because when we compare, for example, small and large systems for the same reason as before, because there is a no correlation between the magnetic field direction and in the small systems, then we expect insensitivity. So in other words, if there is a signal, we would expect that for more or less the same conditions, we should not see that signal in small systems but we might expect to see it in large signals, or at least that is one figure of merit that we can use as part of the compendium of comparisons that we intend to do. So operationally, I'm just gonna go through this quickly uh, because there are just one or two points that I wanna make. So here is, here is the correlation, the correlator that we're saying. So remember, it's a correlation function in the numerator correlation function in the denominator, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you on this branch here because this left branch is for uh, the correlation functions constructed along the magnetic field direction. And this branch over on this side 
is for correlation functions perpendicular to the magnetic field direction. So what do we do? So what we do, of course, is that we build a regular correlation function, but this is a little bit special. So your correlation function is a ratio of two distributions. In the numerator, it would be uh, a measure of the charge separation from in the from in the real events in the denominator what we do is that we don't mix events what we do is that we take the same events which appear in the numerator but we shuffle the charge so what that means then is that my numerator will have a correlation which depends on charge and my denominator will have everything identically the same as the numerator, except that it won't have any charge dependence. And operationally, you just take, uh, you know, the sign components, as I've indicated here, you have to do some weighting for acceptance and so forth. And uh, the whole point is that you construct numerator and denominator the same way. The only difference between numerator and denominator is that the numerator has the charge sensitivity, the denominator does not. What does that mean? It means then that if there is no charge sensitivity, that would cancel, everything would be exactly one. Okay? So that's what you do. On the left hand side, you just do the same thing on the right hand side, except that now you're rotating your plane by 90 degrees effectively. So, uh, what that then says is that you're trying to measure a background do, in the same way that you measured the, uh, the, 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 the signal. Once you have that, of course, you can then just make that ratio of two correlation functions. And, uh, the, you know, the, the point then is that you can do this for more than one moment. And if, you know, later on you have any more questions about the details of this, um, you know, I can address that. So one of the things you can now do, so rather than trying to convince you uh, you know, with a mathematical formalism as to how the correlator works, one of the things we can do is that we can just demonstrate by way of simulations what the response and the sensitivity of the correlator is, so that you get a, a, a basic understanding of how the correlator responds to different scenarios. So we want to see how it responds to uh, a, a proxy CME signal, a proxy CME plus background signal, and one can do multiple models. So, you know, these are all models which are commonly used in the AVI business. Uh, you know, one uses hydrodynamics, one uses so called anomalous uh, viscous fluid dynamics. This is hydrodynamics with uh, some uh, chiral currents included. And uh, of course, uh, you know, the multi-phase transport model and so on. They, what is the point? The point here is that all of these models have been reasonably, have been used successfully, quite successfully to uh, describe you know, various properties like the multiplicity distributions, the V2 or Vns, uh, the resonance, you know, yields and all of these things. So what that would then say is that this is as close to reality for backgrounds as you possibly will. And that, so you can look at these models for purely background effects, or you can introduce a proxy signal in the model and then you can then compare uh, with and without. One little point here is to say that, uh, you know, the, uh, in this anomalous fluid, uh, viscous fluid dynamics model, uh, 
one explicitly introduces a chiral magnetic effect, uh, or another way of saying it is that you put in explicitly chiral currents, which lead to the charge separation. In the, in the AMPT model, uh, th th that there is no such mechanism, but one can still make a proxy CME signal by uh, adjusting the model in such a way as to mimic what a CME, the charge separation that the CME signal would lead to. And you can characterize the magnitude of those signals via input of one sort or another, okay? So, so basically now what I want to do is to walk you through some basic checks to show you how the, 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 the uh, correlator works. So very quickly, it's not a surprise that since you're sampling, uh, so if you, so what I'm doing here is showing you some examples of the correlation functions. So here are distributions. Uh, so this would be uh, the charge separation, this would be the shuffling, and the same would, so this would be along the magnetic field, this would be perpendicular, and then if you build ratios, then you end up with these guys. And the important point is that this can either be convex as indicated here, or it could be concave depending on the relative widths. And of course, the width of these distributions is what encodes the magnitude of the charge separation as I will illustrate right now. But before I do that, let me just point out that there is some basic bookkeeping that has to happen. And that is <clears throat> uh, obviously, uh, you know, you have fluctuations, trivial fluctuations just from charge number. And you have, you're measuring things relative to the reaction plane or event plane. So you have to take into account the event plane resolution effects. And rather than going into gory details, uh, this is an example to show you that we can take a simulation and we know uh, uh, what the answer is for 100% of the particles. And we can disturb the, uh, if the trivial number fluctuations by throwing away some fraction of the number of particles in the event. So say 80%, 60%. When you do that, two things will change. You will change your event plane resolution and you will change your trivial number fluctuations. And you can clearly see here that it's going in exactly the way you expect. That means when you throw away 20% of the particles, you get bigger width, throw away 60%, uh, I mean 40% of the particles, then you see that the width even goes. And now to test whether or not you can reclaim what you had, you can then apply the respective uh, uh, fluctuations, uh, uh, they, they, you can now apply the correction factors which are necessary to take you back to the original. So in other words, this is what you want to come to. And after you do the first correction, you see you come close. And this of course is the last correction. So these are two separate corrections which reflect uh, the respective importance of number fluctuations and the event plane resolution effects. Now you can also introduce a signal in, so this was purely background of a certain type, and you can see the same thing here. So this time you put in a signal and you can clearly see that the width of the signal is uh, getting smaller as the signal size increases, just like you'd expect. And other people have done similar kinds of exercises uh, in different model scenarios and shown, for example, that when there is no signal, then this is flat and sitting at one. And of course, when there is a signal, then you end up with this concave-like shape, okay? All right, so now let me speak some more a little bit about how we, uh, you know, what kinds of backgrounds we're familiar with. Uh, 
and how we handle those and show you uh, so that you can be convinced that when we show you a signal, you will have a, a solid interpretive power. What are these different kinds of backgrounds that influence the situation? There are so-called V2 fluctuations. There is local charge conservation, global momentum conservation. And the, the local charge conservation can come in two flavors. One has to do with the resonance decays. And you know, if you do your hydrodynamic simulations, you might decide that on your freeze out surface, you want to, you know, uh, conserve, you know, make sure that you have local charge conservation and so on. And the whole point then is that you, you have to be able to kind of convince yourself that you have all of these things under control. Okay. All right. So here's one example. And in this case, we took the AMPT model. A1 equals zero means that uh, we turn on, turn off any signal. And in this case, there is no explicit local charge conservation because we wanted to see how the separate effects were working. But of course, the resonances are on, which you, know, you could treat as a different type of uh, conservation. The important takeaway message here is to notice that uh, what one gets is this particular shape. But you notice very importantly that the correlator for psi two, so this is for the second order reaction plane, and the psi three plane, they are pretty much very similar, okay? Why is this important? It's important because it says, we know that psi three can't measure a signal, and the fact that psi two and psi three gives me the same answer, confirms the fact that this is a purely background scenario. Very good. Now, if you turn off your resonances, you see all of this thing goes flat. So that just says that if it's purely V2 and V2 fluctuations, everything cancels out, we're insensitive. But if the resonances are turned on alone, you see that this goes this way. But how can we tell? We can tell because the correlator for psi three or the third order event plane and the second order event plane gives me the same answer. Now I can turn on very, very strong local charge conservation. And remember now, local charge conservation, a very strong local charge conservation is indeed a charge separation. So in this particular case, what you can clearly see is that in this hydro model with strong local charge conservation, you see that now the shape of the correlator is concave, but lo and behold, here is the amazing story. The amazing story is that in this particular case, again, you see that two and three, meaning psi two and psi three correlator, gives me more or less the same answer. Again, the same applies. I cannot measure a signal relative to psi three, but I could in principle measure a signal relative to psi two, but this is telling me that there is no way what I'm measuring can be a signal. And so the fact then that the two of these are more or less similar is an important feature, which then tells you about how to distinguish between background driven versus CME driven, okay? All right, now let me just emphasize that if you used, you know, one of the popular correlators, you know, these effects will show up with significant uh, differences in magnitude. So therefore, this feature is non-trivial in terms of how it helps us to discern between signal and background. Let me now come to another important point. Be and the reason I'm going through these separate pieces of the discussion is because I am going to be showing you very similar comparisons with the data so that you can make up your own minds. So one of the things that is common practice 
for example, is that you can shape engineer events. And you can do this by way of the so-called Q2 vector. And effectively, what you say is that when you sit at a given centrality, the eccentricity fluctuations will be such that you get a distribution. And you can then uh, select on the magnitude of this Q2 distribution. And if you project out V2, for example, and this is in simulation and one sees it in data, you can clearly see that V2 is now a reasonably strong function of Q2, okay? And if you look at other correlators and you do V2 or Q2, you see that there is a strong relationship between the two, okay? But now you can go to a model scenario where you have no signal. So in this case, I'm again using no local chart conservation to simplify the situation, doesn't matter. And in this case, I put resonances in and lo and behold, I make two selections uh, on Q2. So this is low Q2. So that would correspond to small V2. And this is high Q2, which would correspond to large V2. And you can clearly see that the background effects are very well accounted for in the simulation. However, if you now go into the model, and this is a full-fledged model, which includes local chart conservation and the whole shebang. And in this particular case, you put in a CME signal, uh, which is reasonably modest. Then what you find, for example, is that you quickly become independent of the Q2 selection, which is exactly what a CME signal should do. Okay, in other words, if my CME signal is independent of the V2, then it should not have any sensitivity to the Q2 selection. And so this, of course, is one of the things we can then go look for in the data to see whether or not we have sensitivity to Q2 selection. Now let's look at uh, one more uh, sensitivity test, we can also, you know, do the simulations as a function of different reaction planes because they will have different sensitivity to event plane resolution effects and so on and so forth. We can also put in varying degrees of signal. So here there is no signal, here is 2%, here is 2.5, 3, 4, and so on. And the main takeaway is that you can obviously see that I have uh, the expected patterns, which are independent of the event planes that I use. And I have very good sensitivity to signal. In fact, the inverse widths are directly proportional to the input signal and follows more or less a linear relationship, which is, of course, a good thing. Okay, so it says that if we can measure these widths down to with very good statistical significance, we can actually push to rather low values. So that's the quick summary. And now what I want to do in the remaining few, uh, let's say uh, remaining minutes, because I've walked you through this stuff already, it means now I can take you through the data and have the same kinds of comparisons and see where we get. So this is, we made the measurements in the star detector. And the main point, of course, is that when we make the measurement, we can measure the event plane over here, and then we will then correlate particles over here and vice versa. And these are the characteristics of the ranges of the particles that we're using. And mostly we do those kinds of selections to sort of uh, limit the extent of uh, the, the, the acceptance uh, features and uh, things of that nature the usual experimental uh, thing. So here is the first result I wanna show you. And this particular plot here is the same as appears in this recent preprint. And the point that I want to emphasize here is that you can see some similarities here. 
So you notice right away, so what, what is being shown here? This, the red points or red looking points uh, on my screen is for the Psi 2. So that would carry a signal like here. And you see here is the Psi 3. And you see that this is convex looking reminiscent of these AMPT results. So that means that for uh, it, it, the, the fact that these are distinctly different in terms of response between the Psi 3 plane, which cannot be sensitive to CME signal, but the uh, Psi 2 signal could be uh, uh, taking into account a, a CME signal. This already tells you that this concave looking signal cannot, I repeat, cannot be dominated by background. Okay? Now, of course, when we try to quantify, we can do that quantification by simply uh, including as much of the backgrounds as we know of when we go further. But immediately, this tells us that the signal cannot be background dominated simply because of the distinct difference between that measured with the Psi 3 plane versus that measured with the Psi 2 plane. Let me now go to the next step, okay? And this is very, very important because now what we're doing is that we go to more or less the same uh, similar end charge, okay? For light system, this is P goal and D goal. And just for the moment, focus on blue versus red. And what you can clearly see is that here, I have this concave looking shape in for the, you know, as compared to this convex looking shape. Now remember, in the Deagle system, I'm only going to be sensitive to background, okay? Because I don't have any correlation between my event plane, my Psi 2 event plane, and the magnetic field. And look here, you notice that this pattern for the small system is very much reminiscent of what one gets for the Psi 3 plane, which is dominated by background. But you can clearly see that in both cases, the heavy ion scenario is giving you quite a different answer from here. So that then tells us that the, 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 for Psi 2 versus Psi 3, check. For big systems versus small systems, check. Let's do one more check. What we can now do is do the Q2 selection, just as we said before. And let me just quickly remind you, and just so this is now data, we slice it up. You can clearly see that my V2 is very much dependent on Q2 as it should. And let's go to the data real quick. And this is just a quick reminder. So this is to remind you from the model simulation when there was no signal. This over here is what happens to the data. When I make zero to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 80, and it's obvious that you see that there is no sensitivity to the Q2 selection. But if you were background driven, you would expect that sensitivity. I remind you here that this pattern is exactly the same pattern as you would expect from this guy over here. So the point then is that these patterns are pointing in the same direction, okay? So you can also do this as a function of centrality to sort of map out. And why would you want to do that? Everybody knows that the magnetic field strength increases as a function as you go more peripheral until you get very, very peripheral. And so what you might then expect is that the width should change. Now, let me just remind you 
Remember, we can't assign that change to the V2. And the reason we can't is simply because we already convinced ourselves that we don't have sensitivity to Q2. And so that means that these inverse widths then are, uh, you know, what we would think is uh, reasonably attributable to a CME style signal. And it has the right patterns. It increases as you would expect with the B field and as well as with better correlations with the event plane and maybe depending on whose model enhance axial charge per entropy and so on and so forth. So the quick summary, and then I will do one, take a few more minutes, uh, not more than four or so, and, and make one more statement. So here's the quick summary of the data. What I'm saying that you absolutely cannot account for this in any consistent background scenario in the sense that here you see that my psi two and psi three are distinctly different. My small systems versus large difference, that means the small system should look more like the psi three of the large systems and that's exactly what you see. And the Q2 selectivity for signal, you don't expect any sensitivity. And this is exactly what you see. So the whole bottom line here, and as well, of course, the centrality dependence. So the whole point is that the combined measures, you would say are consistent with a CME driven chart separation. But equally important is the fact that it is incompatible with background driven chart separation alone. There's just no way you can get all of these features to line up in a consistent fashion if it was completely background, okay? All right, so now let me just quickly say, uh, what does this mean for signal, okay? And again, of course, as I showed you before, we did our sensitivity test, but we can use these same tests to calibrate the signal. And so here we can, uh, try to do such a calibration. So for example, you can run both models. What I can quickly tell you is that both, remember that the, the A1s from the two models will be uh, roughly different because when you do the calibration, you find that they differ by about a factor of two, but that's okay because the way that the signals are implemented in the model, that is to be expected. So that's perfectly fine. And so, uh, seeing a factor of roughly a factor of two difference uh, doesn't mean anything here. So with the data, you see that we can account for uh, signals of that type, and it would be a fairly modest size signal. I'll show you a table in a little bit. Just to just make the point that I want to make. In other words, if you do the AVFD model, okay, where you put in different amounts of uh, signal, you see you get a linear dependence. You do the same thing for the AMPT. You see that you get a linear dependence on the inverse widths. Here are inverse widths. So it is fairly straightforward to do a calibration. And so what you can then is that you can infer that you, you know, depending on which, whether you, you prefer AVFD or AMPT, what matters is the relative change. So you see that you go from about a half a percent here up to about two and correspondingly the same change. So you, you, you might argue in terms of what the overall magnitude of the signal might be, but the, the relative change is not uh, in dispute. Now, one thing you can do quickly just uh, to uh, uh, round out and be done is that you can say, now suppose I take this signal here, in other words, for the same events that I use to calibrate the CME signal, I can also use it to calibrate another correlator. And if you do that, of course, you get some calibration curve that looks sort of like this. You can come to this uh, value here, in other words, I take the value from here. So for example, I take uh, roughly this value, the A1 that I extracted from this, say, let's say I do, it would be something like 2.6-ish, something like that, okay? 
because the centrality is a little bit different. And now if I come over here at 2.6, so that means what I get from the R correlator, our correlator, would correspond to this point on this map. And if you now translate this back over here into the equivalent fraction of signal measured with, let's say, the delta gamma correlator, it would imply of the order of, say, 10 to 15 percent, which is sort of what uh, many people claim that they estimate to be nowadays. So, in other words, the signal that we're extracting wouldn't in principle be significantly incompatible with uh, you know, alternative approaches. It's just that we see a more sizable looking signal, but when translated in real terms, it, it, it's not a problem. And so let me take two minutes and just say that, of course, there's an isobar run, uh, which is ongoing. And the basic idea, of course, is that with these two isobars, you should have a roughly a 10% difference in the magnetic field. And one expects or hopes that you might be able to detect that difference in the resulting chiral magnetic effect. Uh, we did some uh, anomalous viscous fluid dynamics uh, simulations and convinced ourselves that we should be able to detect this. And this is a little quick uh, rendition to show that for the different isobars, one should show roughly about a 10% difference in signal. If we're lucky, then of course we'll see it, but we'll find out. So our current strategy is uh, of course to do the following, is to measure the signal for each isobar. So in other words, we would hope to measure, let's say, a psi three and psi two. Remember, this is not actual data. This is how we're thinking. So here would be one isobar, here would be another. We could do our psi two, psi three measurements. We could also uh, do the Q2 dependence uh, of that to convince ourselves. And then we would measure the relative signal strength of the isobar, which means that we can measure the difference or the ratio. But what is the point? The point is, we could be sensitive to a signal from each isobar, but not necessarily be sensitive to the signal difference. So one needs to make those as separate measurements. And finally, we want to be able to measure the relative background strength of the isobars, which we know how to do, because we know how to measure a pure background signal for each isobar, which means then that we can compare those and convince ourselves that those backgrounds are either similar or very, very different, okay? And of course, we can make isobaric ratios and stuff like that. And if, if the backgrounds were identical, then you see that this should be flat and the signal would then show up as this uh, feature here and so on, okay? So I come to my summary and the two takeaway messages are exactly like I advertised at the beginning. That is that we think we have a correlator that does a good job in measuring charge separation driven by CME. It mitigates some of the very well-known backgrounds, which has uh, served as a problem. And of course, when we quantify the resulting signal, it behaves uh, from an experimental perspective, that is, it has all of the characteristics which we have validated in the model simulations to convince ourselves that we know what we're doing. And the extracted signal also behaves uh, in ways that would make sense, at least to me. And so the hope, of course, is that uh, in short order, of course, the isobar run is ongoing. Uh, they, they, I mean, not the run, but the data analysis is ongoing, lots of progress. This is uh, a little bit more delicate because it's a blinded analysis, which means that there are lots of protocols and various agreements that one has to go through. So it's taking a little longer, but uh, I would say that uh, 
uh, things are progressing very well and we have great anticipation uh, to see uh, what the outcome is. And thank you very much. And I'll take questions. Thank you very much. Um, people who have questions, maybe put them in the chat that you're, you, you have a question and I'll put you in line. Um, anyone has questions? Or maybe you can just raise hands and ask, I guess. Yeah, we have a lot of participants, so I might not see a raised hand. Oh, okay. Sure. Anyone? Take one, take two, and if you don't, even Mike. So I have a question. Okay. Uh, I, ha I, ha I have a question. I mean, maybe I, you've shown quite a few plots and maybe I missed it, but um, your correlator is, and it has to be a numerator versus a denominator. Um, did you show separately how the numerator and the denominator change? Uh, I mean, I mean ki kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, so over, over, so here is an example. Uh, I mean, we've done this for data as well. Yeah. But this is just to show, you know. So the the point that I'm making here is the following, right? So one correlation function is along the magnetic field. So that means it can measure signal and background if there is background, yes? Sure. The, the other correlation function measures perpendicular. So that can only contain background. So in a way, the ratio, this ratio is sort yeah. of referencing this signal plus background to this background, yes? Yeah, no, I mean, I understand perfectly the rationale. I understand yes. perfectly the rationale. It's mm -hmm. just that there is a very famous mathematical theorem that says that the ratio of two boring curves is an, can be an interesting curve. <laughs> so so, so the, the point of this particular example is to show you that when you sample, right, from a distribution, these should be Gaussian, yes? Mm -hmm. And then the ratio of Gaussians should be Gaussian and uh, and of course they whether or not it is convex or concave in shape will depend on the relative width mm. so but what I tried to show was that what it's not whether they you know the the signal has to be concave but a very very important point is this point here that is that the distinction between the psi two and psi three. So in other words, if I don't see a difference between the answer for the psi two and psi three, or let's say they, they don't even have to be very different. If they were closely related, then the conclusion would have to be that this is mostly background because the psi three measurement can only measure background but yes. the psi two measurement can measure background and signal. And the question would be how much background there may be. Okay. 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 And in the data, so let me just quickly go to the data. So in the data, this now is data. This is, uh, I, you know, I didn't focus only on this one, but you see, I can do it for more than one system. You see that this is convex which is psi three, which is supposed to be a measure of my background. And this, of course, is quite the opposite. And then you go to small systems versus large systems, and you see that small system psi two looks like background. So okay. in unlike the other measurements where one was obtaining similar patterns for small systems and large systems. Here, we see a distinct difference between small systems and large systems, as you would expect for a signal. 
Okay, Mileto, you can. Next question is Mileto Graziano. Shall I read it out or can you do you want to unmute yourself and uh, uh, and ask? I guess you cannot unmute yourself. Because, well, so the question in text is, do you believe that gi the giant dipole resonance has an effect here? Do you um, believe that dipole resonance can intervene? And could, you know, I mean, so, you know, so I, I don't think so. And the reason I don't think so is because, you know, um, we're at beam energies, uh, which are pretty large, right? I mean, you know, the collisions energies here are 200 jev. And giant dipole excitations, you know, are, you know, sure. uh, th you know, in the KEV sort of range. So, so the, the, the scale of the effects that we're looking for are way, uh, you know, I, I would say that we were those excitations would be unusual to show up here. Oleg? Well, oh, thank, thank. Um, hi, hi, Roy. I, I just wanted to ask uh, does it may, uh, can it have any sense to consider also some intermediate planes like uh, 45 degrees or so? Or it will be more or less the same as shape engineering. Um, well, I mean, you know, the the, the uh, well, it, it, what would be your motivation? I mean, I, you know, of no, course, be, be, because because actually we know only perpendicular component of of um, magnetic field is relevant, so it should be some particular say cosine squared theta dependence and then uh, right. it, it can but, give some complementary probe I, I, I thought. Well it, it, it may be but, but keep in mind right that technically the reaction plane is fluctuating quite a bit. Oh yes yes I see yes. So, so it, it, the, the, those fluctuations which we correct for already more or less includes what you're arguing for. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it's uh, just I was thinking about some complementary way. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. I understand. I understand. Yeah. yeah. But it, but the, 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 the classic case, of course, is that when you go to the small systems, then when you go to these small systems, what of, of course happens is that your event plane is now decorrelated with the magnetic field. And you can clearly see that these side two measurements yep. now show you background type results. Yes? Yeah, it's a sort of extreme. Yeah. It's the extreme, exactly. The extreme of what you're asking for. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, then. <laughs> Any more questions? I do have a follow up. I mean, yeah. is there a perspective to do a rapidity scan of this observable? Because the magnetic field in any reasonable model should decrease very rapidly away from mid rapidity. If there is. Um, yeah, is there an ex is there currently a, an experiment that could measure this away from mid rapidity? Um, um, not so not easily. So um, at Rick, it's a little, it's bit, a little tricky. bit tricky because remember, because we, remember have we have the TPC. The TPC. We, have some we have some. We have some detectors. Have some detectors. At forward, you know, like the new event plane detector and so on. But those only allow us to measure different event planes, you know, at varying pseudo rapidity gaps from the central arm. But most of where we're detecting the particles is still in mid rapidity. 
Now, if you go to LHC, I don't know, maybe one could play some games on the edges, but, um, you know, one would first need to know, you know, what sort of signals you had there to begin with to see if there is an eta dependence. Um, so, yeah, so for the moment, it's not so easy. I mean, we can measure relative to many different event planes, but we can't, we, we, we don't, we are stuck with roughly one unit of rapidity. I mean, pseudo rapidity. Okay. Maybe with the, with the improved TPC, you know, maybe we can push that out to maybe something like one and a half. I don't remember exactly what the increase is, but that would still be, you know, if you look at your multiplicity density, it would still be roughly flat over that region, right? Sure. Yeah. Sure. I suspect that you're you're interested in going out on the falling edge. Yeah. Of because the distribution. There no, because there is no magnetic field there, probably. I mean. <laughs> uh, yeah. You would think, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or let's say it should be weakened quite by quite a bit. At least that's what I would guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My prejudice was always that the magnetic field is irrelevant for for heavy ion physics because everything in rapidity i mean in the audience we have one limiting fragmentation specialist everything limiting fragments very well this would be a breaking but of course this variable has never been seen well uh, yeah i was going to say that uh, i can show quite unequivocally that the, the limiting fragmentation or the indications of limiting fragmentation, you know, can, can be understood in an alternative scheme. But, you know, that's a different story altogether. I'll come back. <laughs> All right. Mm. Um, last chance. If not, Thank you very much for thank you very much for a very very interesting talk. Thank for everyone attending. You are actually this was the second most attended talk in our se series seminar. Oh well, I I hope I I hope uh, uh, most of my audience got to take away something good. So let me plug one last time. There is a signal. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope to see you one of these days soon in person. All right. Well, and your friends too. Thank you. Finishing right. the recording. See you soon. All right. Bye-bye.